uh, which is in connection with not only the core, but Professor Stockdale's core three, which I'm hearing wonderful, wonderful things about. So, uh, you know, this is this is an important event. Uh, we are really thrilled to have uh, Dr. Bill Rush here from Yale University. Um, and he is here because of his connection with one of our priest community, a uh, member of our priest community and faculty member uh, in the seminary, Monsignor Jack Badano, who's a really good friend of mine and a member of the R. Seton Hall San Egidio prayer community. And that's how we connected uh, with Dr. Rush because we met at a San Egidio event in New York City. That's the start of the whole event. So I'm going to turn it over to Monsignor Adana who can give a, an introduction in more detail. Because they have been friends for many, many years and worked together in the field of the Monsignor. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Nancy. So I'd like to introduce Dr. William Rush. He's uh, Professor at Yale Divinity School, been there, I think, some 23 years. 26. 26 years at Yale Divinity School, specialized in, in Luther studies. He's a Lutheran of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and uh, he's been deeply involved all his life in ecumenical matters, ecumenical matters, promoting promoting Christian unity and helping his church, especially to be aware of it and to be involved in it. And um, in his early years, he was um, a member of the, of the um, Commission on Faith and Order of the National Council of Churches. He was the director of ecumenism in his the Lutheran Church in America, and then when it grew, combined with two other Lutheran churches, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, he was the ecumenical officer of that as well. He was the director of the Commission on Faith and Order of the National Council of Churches, then a member of the Commission on Faith and Order of the World Council of Churches, where many Contacts are made with, with uh, all of the Christian families belong to the to that. And um, the, um, I'd like to just mention a couple of things about his, his ecumenical activities in the 1980s. It goes back a while, but they were important, important events that, that took place. And so one of the things he did that I always found fascinating was that uh, in his church, the Lutheran Church in America, in the 1980s, he would organize um, journeys, trips. He would gather together a number of Lutheran bishops and take them on journeys that would go to Rome, where they'd meet the Pope, He'd go to Constantinople, where they'd meet the ecumenical patriarch. He went to England and met leaders of the Anglican communion. They'd go to Geneva in, in, in Switzerland to visit the World Council of Churches. That was an educational process for them. And also because one of the important things about ecumenism is to, to come out of your own tradition, to explain your own tradition well, and to listen as others explain their tradition. That's a way of uh, getting into the dialogue with each other. You have to understand what, uh, what you, what the, who the other partner is and what, uh, what they understand, what their faith tradition is. And so after the Reformation, in the 16th century, when the churches split and we spent the next several centuries divided, still are divided in some way, in many ways, but divided with hostility, misunderstanding, all of the things that keep people apart. So when the ecumenical movement began in the early 20th century, the purpose was to do the opposite, namely to help the different Christian groups understand each other, 
to bring them together, be, enable them to talk with each other, engage in dialogue together. And, but the first step is to come to know each other. So he organized a number of those trips, bringing Lutheran bishops to meet the Pope and the other leaders that I mentioned before. That to me was, uh, was a very important uh, development uh, in regard to the Catholic Church, he's also uh, done a lot of writing. He wrote a book. He edited a book some years ago about on uh, Pope uh, Benedict XVI. And what he did uh, was to invite ecumenical leaders of various churches. He had uh, Catholic authors, Lutheran authors, Anglican, Orthodox, Pentecostal, uh, and ask them, how do you, ask them, how do you interpret Pope Benedict? And it was Pope Benedict premises and promises. The premises were before the Pope became Pope, Cardinal, he was Cardinal Ratzinger, one of the great theologians in the Catholic Church. And people followed him very, uh, very well. So the premises from what he did as a theologian to the promises, what he would do as Pope. It was a very interesting way of getting, of, of, of getting people to know Pope Benedict. So he's done a number of those uh, type of things, creative, creative things in order to, um, get the different churches, Lutherans and Catholics, Lutherans and others, Catholics and others to understand each other. And so he spent his life uh, doing that. And so uh, I don't think I need to give any more background than that, but just to now welcome him. So and, and we've, the theme that he chose was the question of um, the Lutheran the Lutheran Reformation from a Lutheran perspective. So how, how a Lutheran understands the Reformation, it's understood differently by Catholics, understood by others. How does a Lutheran understand the Reformation and what it was all about? So we invite him now to give his address. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for the warm welcome. and. <clears throat> even a bit of history. <clears throat> I would just say about the formulation of this topic, uh, I didn't exactly select it. It came as a result of ecumenical negotiation uh, <laughs> with friends. But in any case, you've been very kind to invite me to be with you and to address a specific topic. And I intend to be faithful to that request and to speak about the Lutheran Reformation from a Lutheran perspective. This title calls for some initial comments. First of all, it is the Lutheran Reformation. There have been a number of reformations in the history of the church. I'm not going to speak about the Continental Reformation, the English Reformation, or the Reformed. Reformation. There also have been reforming movements in the church, both before and after the 16th century. Each of these reforms had its own specific characteristics, and all of that is beyond our purview today. The focus here is the Lutheran Reformation. This means that we will inevitably have to speak about an individual named Martin Luther, as you'll shortly observe. Any perspectives on the Lutheran Reformation must be closely connected to the opinions about Martin Luther's life and thought. And at the outset of these remarks, I wish to be very clear. I have this afternoon only one thesis to offer, not 95. <laughs> okay. The thesis is 
that any perspective on the Lutheran Reformation will be determined about how Martin Luther has been perceived. And I need to be sure that I am clear here. I'm not suggesting that Luther is the totality of the Lutheran Reformation. There were political, social, theological factors in addition to the personality of Luther and the theological positions that he promoted. He was also not the only person involved in the Lutheran Reformation. He had supporters and colleagues, some of whom it could be argued were far more influential than Luther himself about the future course of events. And yet without this Augustinian friar, theologian and pastor, the Lutheran Reformation would have been inconceivable. Now I want to mention the second part of the theme of today, a Lutheran perspective. What I will be sharing with you will indeed be a Lutheran perspective, mine. But I trust that it's not mine alone. Here I'm representing what I believe is a Lutheran consensus today. And I should underscore the word today. As I hope to point out, Lutheran perspectives, as well as Catholic on this subject, have not remained constant over five centuries. I will not claim that my perspective represents a unanimous opinion of 80 million or more Lutherans around the world. Yet I will insist that it's not the novel thought of one atypical Lutheran, namely me. And we'll need to begin by looking at the 16th century event. It has some characteristics agreed upon by all who reflect upon this event. And I'm only going to mention a few of them here. <clears throat> this Reformation split and continues to divide the Western church. It's had a continuing impact on all of Christianity. In time, it split and continues to split Western Protestantism. It contributed to political instability in Western Europe. All negatives, I'm sure we would acknowledge. And yet, without suggesting that the positives outweigh the negatives, the tragic, negative, global factors, there were and there do remain some positives from this event in history. The Lutheran Reformation brought theological clarity in a number of areas of the church's life, not least of which was the doctrine of justification by grace through faith. It enhanced theological discussion and a renewed understanding of Christianity. It enlivened and revived the Roman Catholic Church. Without the Lutheran Reformation, it is difficult to imagine the Roman Catholic Church experiencing its counter-reformation. Although I want to add, I am aware of the fact that there are Catholic theologians who would argue that the renewal of their church would have occurred without the Lutheran Reformation. I'm dubious. Now, I know that I'm on somewhat slippery ground here. I don't want for one moment to be heard as saying that the Lutheran Reformation brought benefits that exceeded the damage that was done. I'm not saying that. I am stating that there were both bad, extremely bad effects of this Reformation and some results that can only be viewed in an affirming light. This dual character of the Lutheran Reformation 
was clearly acknowledged by Pope Francis and Bishop Nubi Yunan, the president of the Lutheran World Federation. When they were together in Lund, Sweden on October 31st, 2016, they stated together, we are profoundly thankful for the spiritual and theological gifts received through the Reformation. We also confess and lament before Christ that Lutherans and Catholics have wounded the visible unity of the church. In the 16th century and the several ensuing centuries, that was certainly not the predominant view of Roman Catholics or of those who acquired the label Lutherans. Caricatures existed on both sides. These views concentrated on the person of Martin Luther. This reformation was certainly considered a Lutheran reformation caused by one Martin Luther. For Catholics, this reformation was an unmitigated tragedy fueled by an immoral, heretical friar in Germany who was unfaithful to his vows. He destroyed the unity of Christ's church with his ruthless polemic and replaced true Christian faith with his own opinions, which put in peril the salvation of countless souls. For Lutherans, this reformation rediscovered the core of true Christian faith and rescued the same countless souls from a Christianity that over the centuries had lost its way. Now this description is stark. While it's largely accurate, it overlooks individuals on both sides of the divide who wish to avoid or heal this developing division and who did not see the issues as all black and light. Yet on both sides, these individuals were a minority. If one examines in detail, which I can't do here, the literature produced by both sides, the majority view can be documented. From the 16th century onward, there were Roman Catholic writings that focused on a misreading of Luther, the person, and which ignored or distorted his theological views. There's evidence for this as late as the 1920s. On the Lutheran side, there were portraits of Luther, beginning with his contemporaries, that moved quickly into the area of hagiography. Luther was a figure who could do no wrong. His violent temper was ignored. His erroneous and harmful views of others, including the Jewish people, were sidestepped. He was the rescuer of Christianity at a time of extreme danger for the integrity of the faith. If you had invited me to come here and to address this subject some 80 or 90 years ago, this would have ended my comments. The question is, what's changed? A change that has influenced not only a Lutheran perspective, but also Catholic views. My premise here is that an alteration in the estimation of Luther caused a change in the perspective of the Lutheran Reformation, not only for Lutherans, but also for Roman Catholics. This new chapter was made possible in large measure by the accessibility of relevant sources in well-edited editions. The standard critical edition is the Weimar edition, D. Luther's Werke, which was started in 1883 
and continued into the last years of the 20th century. For English readers without German and Latin, there is Luther's works, begun in 1955 and continuing to the present day. These resources allowed scholars and others to read Luther and not only books about Luther. From this availability, two developments occurred. One has been described as the Luther Renaissance. Its origins are in the early years of the last century and associated with names like Ernest Trouch, Karl Hull. This Renaissance concentrated on Luther's theology rather than his role in the development of modern liberalism. It was concerned with an impartial evaluation of Luther's achievements and their contemporary relevance. While this Luther Renaissance has not avoided criticism in recent years, including from Lutherans, by the way, it did mark a significant chapter in the evaluation of Luther. Moving beyond this Renaissance, theologians like Christine Helmer and Volker Lipkin, my new colleague at Yale, have seen that Luther now must be viewed as more medieval, more philosophical, more Catholic than has been previously thought. This understanding means that when Lutherans and Roman Catholics enter into a debate about Luther, they are not discussing someone outside the Catholic tradition, but someone within that Catholic tradition. Luther is considered, and this is the way I teach him, Luther is considered as a late medieval Catholic theologian grappling with questions that were not finally resolved in the Western tradition. And that last point is very important. Now, an almost simultaneous development was taking place in Roman Catholic theology. Serious Roman Catholic scholars were placing aside the prejudices of four centuries and taking a new look at Luther and his writings. This group included Walter Kohler, Herbert Juden, and most notably Joseph Lortz, a Jesuit, who published in 1939 an examination of the political, cultural, and religious causes for the Reformation. Lortz criticized Luther for developing a religious subjectivity that he saw as partially responsible for destroying the unity of the Western church. Yet Lortz recognized Luther's spiritual creativity and finally concluded that Luther was a monk who took his Christian life and his life in orders very seriously. Lortz saw Luther against the background of a crisis in the church and theology in the late medieval ages. And he concluded with, I think, considerable theological understanding. And I quote here, Luther had in his own person wrestled into submission a Catholicism, which was not Catholic. The end of the quote. Now, this view has naturally been attractive to Lutheran Roman Catholic ecumenical discussions. It allows Catholic theologians to regard Luther's arguments against scholastic theology as largely justified, since they were directed against a decadent scholasticism. And it allows Luther's Lutherans to grant that Luther's views was attacking, were attacking 
something that was not authentic Catholic teaching. A more complex view of this by historians of medieval theology and medieval intellectual traditions have pointed out that the issues may be a bit more complex than I have just described. But I state this matter in a manner of fact and fairness. I can't explore it more fully here, but I do want to acknowledge these developments made possible Lutheran Roman Catholic ecumenical advance. Now, the result of all of this scholarly attention and reflection, both Lutheran and Catholic, did not remind, did not remain esoteric. It had practical effects. In 1970, Cardinal Johannes Villebrands, the president of the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity at the Vatican, addressed the Lutheran World Federation. And he declared, and I'm quoting now, a more just assessment of the person and work of Martin Luther on the Catholic side is a necessary path towards restoring lost unity, end of quote. But Cardinal Lillebrands went on to describe Luther as a teacher of the faith. The Cardinal repeated these events, pardon me, repeated these views in an address to the convention of the Lutheran Church in America in 1984. In 1983, the 500th anniversary of Luther's birth, and in 1996, the 450th anniversary of Luther's death, Pope John Paul II acknowledged Luther's deep religiosity, driven by the question of eternal salvation, and Luther's attentiveness to the word of God and his will for a spiritual renewal of the church. Pope Benedict XVI, during his visit to the Augustinian monastery in Erford, I would argue, went even further, speaking of Luther's concrete and passionate search for God rooted in the Christocentrism of his theology. Now, these public and official statements do not make Luther a Catholic in good standing, and they're not intended to do that. Yet they disclose a remarkable change in Roman Catholic understanding of Luther. This positive effect on Lutherans and thus on Lutheran perspectives of the Lutheran Reformation cannot be overestimated. Similar Lutheran statements should not be overlooked. In 1970, the Lutheran World Federation at its General Assembly indicated its willingness to see, and here I quote, how the judgment of the reformers on the Roman Catholic Church and the theology of the time was not free from polemical distortions, which in part remain to this day. And they went on to say, therefore we sincerely regret that our Roman Catholic brothers, and they should have added sisters, but they didn't, but our Roman Catholic brothers, and I will add it, sisters, that they have been unfortunately offended and misunderstood by these polemical representations. Now, one thing that is certainly apparent this afternoon, I'm not able to speak for Roman Catholics, but I can believe that such a statement could only have a positive influence and effect in Catholic circles. It is the outcome of such scholarship and such statements, both, that the International Lutheran Roman Catholic Dialogue recognized the present state of evaluations of Martin Luther. 
in 1983, the 500th anniversary of Luther's birth. It published a document entitled Martin Luther, Witness to Jesus Christ. While this text has not officially been received by the sponsoring churches, it is an accurate indication of Lutheran and Catholic perspectives on Luther in the late 20th century. The statement is realistic with no sugarcoating of the hard facts of the 16th century and subsequent views about Luther. But I would suggest that one statement in this text summarizes the document. And here I'm quoting, in our time, Luther research and biblical studies on both sides have again opened the way for a mutual understanding of the central concerns of the Lutheran Reformation. Awareness of the historical conditionness, their word, of all forms of expression and thought have contributed to a widespread recognition among Catholics that Luther's views, particularly on justification, are a legitimate form of Christian theology. Close quotes. This acknowledgement, along with a continuing recognition, and here I quote, it is possible for us today to learn from Luther together. In this, we could all learn from him that God must always remain the Lord and that our most important human answer must always be absolute confidence in God and our adoration of him. Close quote. That quote is actually a quote from an earlier address by Cardinal Villebrunz. In the context of this presentation, I wish to note that such a document from the international dialogue has an influence for both Lutheran and Roman Catholic perspectives of the Lutheran Reformation. These insights and conclusions continue to be expressed in Lutheran Roman Catholic dialogues. In 2013, the Lutheran Roman Catholic Commission on Unity issued a report with a title, From Conflict to Communion, Lutheran Catholic Common Commemoration of the Reformation in 2017. Like the earlier text, the title tells all. The same approach and ideas are present. A glance at the table of contents reveals what is coming. Commemorating the Reformation in an ecumenical and global age. New perspectives on Martin Luther and the Reformation. A historical sketch of the Lutheran Reformation and a Catholic response. Basic themes of Martin Luther's theology in the light of Lutheran Roman Catholic dialogue. And a final section where there are described five ecumenical imperatives for Lutherans and Roman Catholics. This document did much to contribute to the historic meeting in Lund in 2016 of Pope Francis with the leaders of the Lutheran World Federation, a meeting which I mentioned earlier. To state what I trust, is becoming obvious in these comments is the following. My original thesis is indeed correct, namely that any perspective on the Lutheran Reformation will be determined by how Luther is perceived. But this perception is not static. It has been in flux, not from a desire to rewrite history, but from a desire for a more accurate picture of that individual, his historical settings, and the movement that he set in motion. This trajectory 
with its two insights of a revision of the Catholic image of Luther and a more nuanced view of the late medieval period and Luther's place in it by Lutherans has formed a contemporary Lutheran perspective of the Lutheran Reformation, which I claim as mine, but not mine alone. There are many others, and I believe also Roman Catholics who would share this view. So in sum, there is no Lutheran perspective on the Lutheran Reformation. There is a new Lutheran Roman Catholic perspective on the Reformation. It is a perspective that moves beyond polemic to recognize a mutually caused catastrophe. It is a tragedy not completely lacking in benefits. It was obviously not unavoidable in view of the present then circumstances. And yet this new perspective holds the potential for a large scale, if not complete, reconciliation. In fact, you will find in many Lutheran parishes, what was once described as Reformation Sunday is now described as Reconciliation Reformation Sunday. This new perspective of the Lutheran Reformation and of its chief proponent has supplied energy and potential for our ecumenical journey into the 20th century and into the 21st century. That journey is still before us. It's not ended, but what will we need to confront on this journey? As the joint declaration on the doctrine of justification signed in 1999, in which I cannot describe here because of time, mentions Lutherans and Roman Catholics need further clarification for greater unity. They need greater clarification on ecclesiology, ecclesial authority, models of church unity, and ministry and sacraments. One way to address this need is to draft a common declaration on church, ministry, and Eucharist. Cardinal Kurt Cook, the present president of the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity, has endorsed this idea. In my most recent book, Toward a Common Future, Ecumenical Reception, and a New Consensus, I drafted such a declaration. I do not expect a future Lutheran Roman Catholic dialogue or the churches involved simply to receive my draft as an official statement. But I do hope it might be considered as a resource on the way to such an official statement. Also on this journey, Lutherans and Roman Catholics will have to address some 50 years of dialogue between us. There are countless pages of dialogue work about which the churches must make decisions. This is the challenge and opportunity of ecumenical reception, something which I've described elsewhere and I will not go into here. But there is good reason in all of these matters for hope for continuing progress toward closer relations as we travel together toward that goal of full visible unity. Yet there is also the need for realism about factors that retard this advance. And let me mention just a few without dwelling on them. In the Lutheran community, there have been decisions about ordained ministry, ethical and sexual matters that have the potential for being church dividing. I'm not saying that they are, but they do require careful study and discussion to make a determination on that point. 
In the Roman Catholic Church, there's continuing debate about the reception and meaning of the Second Vatican Council. There also seems to be a shift in tone about the conclusions of our international dialogue. Earlier dialogue reports asked the churches to consider concrete steps towards visible unity based on their work. The last two reports from the dialogue do not request such action. Rather, the reports are described as study documents and are not to be considered for reception. These concerns and developments, both Lutheran and Catholic, reveal that the path to visible unity is never easy. And finally, without the gift and guidance of God's spirit, the goal will not be reached. The road is not always smooth. We have lived for five centuries, largely in isolation from each other. So this effort is not for the faint hearted. But 50 years ago, who would have predicted where Lutheran Roman Catholic relations are today? We do not have the option of being weary on this road. Pope John Paul II in Urunum Sint was very clear about that for all of us. And yet, as a final word, let me give a concrete example of the practical shift in this Lutheran Roman Catholic perspective of the Lutheran Reformation that I've been trying to describe here this afternoon. Today, on November 9th, in the year 2022, you, a Roman Catholic university, invited me, a Lutheran pastor, to come into your midst and to speak about such matters that are intimate to the very identity of the Christian faith. Once a Catholic institution would not have extended such a gracious invitation. And if extended, I fear the possibility of a Lutheran refusal would have been great. But those attitudes do not exist today. Today is November 9th. Tomorrow is November 10th, the 529th anniversary, the birth of Martin Luther. Thank you for sharing your time with me. I wonder if I may take the privilege as one who's moderating this. Bring a question, bring a first question. And um, I, I think this would not be, not be something that can be more than an introduction here. But I'd like to just place it on the table and to see what, what you are thinking. I think um, a lot of Catholics might ask the question, what about the papacy in this? Now, there has been in Lutheran Catholic dialogue in the United States, a dialogue on the papacy, very good dialogue that has produced good results. And um, just wondering how, and I don't want to push this too far because requires a great deal of maybe a great deal of discussion, but how would you think would Lutherans today consider the concern of Catholics that somehow in the church, ecumenical church of the future, that is the the where unity has been achieved, uh, a role, an important role for the Bishop of Rome would, would be part of it. Catholics would, would think. 
just wondering what you might, uh, how you might in the beginning of the response to that. Well, first of all, <laughs> one has to acknowledge that John the 23rd, John Paul the second, and this is a little controversial, but I will say it, Benedict the 16th and Pope Francis have changed the perception of many Lutherans about the Bishop of Rome. Just the way those individuals have exercised their office. Now, as Monsignor Rodano mentioned, the Lutheran Roman Catholic dialogue in the United States took up the topic of primacy in the church. And to paraphrase the final agreed upon report, Lutherans and Roman Catholics agreed that a papacy under the gospel, now that's a very important phrase, but under the gospel is indeed the, probably the preeminent way to exercise primacy in the church. That needs to be further explored. There is a document in the Lutheran Confessions, the Book of Concord, a treatise on the primacy, the power and primacy of the Pope. Not written by Luther, but written by his colleague, Philip Melanchthon that I think would surprise many Roman Catholics if they read that document. But again, on both sides, we got caught up in polemic. And in the intervening history, things happened which make resolution there more challenging. I, I, you could say much, much more. You don't want me to. <laughs> Up to you. No, but, no. Uh, please, I'll open the floor. Who would like to bring a question, comment, talk to us? Yes. Um, in what forums do you see the medical dialogue proceeding most successfully? Is it just one area, one organization? Is it, you know, uh, I, I noticed your um, bio, there was the Tantor mentioned in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. um, what particular forms do you see the dialogue progressing the most? Well, the dialogue can exist in many places, and it should, in local churches, uh, in national churches. But finally, for magisterial kind of action, uh, it's got to be a dialogue of the Lutheran World Federation on behalf of the Lutheran member churches. And for you, the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity, which will ultimately inv involve the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith uh, and the Pope himself. So, I mean, there's no exclusive place for the dialogue. It should in blossom in many places, and there's material out there that can be used to do it. But you cannot substitute all of that for the official dialogue between our churches. I mean, the significance of the joint declaration on the doctrine of justification is that the Roman Catholic Church at its highest level of authority and the global Lutheran community at its highest, highest level of authority accepted that statement. And no substitute for that. By right. the way, that's the only time so far that's happened. And is there uh, regular meetings of the two communities? Yes. <laughs> this is an international dialogue that continues. And uh, it started, meaning that it was the first dialogue after Vatican II. And it started, uh, first meeting was in 1967. Since then, it's continued. One, one dialogue. So report, then a new session will begin that would produce a report that's been happening, happening since one of the best, one of the best of our. Uh, right. And the, did I just say the staff of the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity yes. and the staff of the Lutheran World Federation meet what at least annually. 
Right. Yes. Okay. Yes. And and you can read those proceedings. No. No. When they come out, they publish. <laughs> More than you want to read. <laughs> No executive summary at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What are your thoughts? Pope Francis actually uh, has spoken and written a lot about the dialogue of life. Personally, I am a huge believer in the dialogue of life, which we are doing now, inviting you to talk to the students. And so, what are your thoughts on this? The dialogue of life and the sharing. Do you think that this is more? And the, the higher level committees, uh, or they should work, you know, together. It's both and if things are going to happen, it requires both. And I mean, when Senior Rodano mentioned it was frankly part of my strategy, I guess not very subtle. <laughs> uh, if you can get Lutheran bishops. To be willing to be open to their Catholic counterparts. That's that's a big plus. That's a way to legitimize conversation. There's no substitute for the personal. I, I mentioned in a recent lecture at the Centro, I said there's there's really a profound paradox in ecumenical literature. It's supposed to be anonymous. You're not supposed to know who wrote it. You shouldn't know who wrote Udunum Sint, and you shouldn't know who wrote the Declaration on Ecumenism of the ELCA, uh, and so on. So they're supposed to be anonymous in that sense. And yet the personal trust of the people involved yeah. were critical in making those things happen. Exactly. No, I, I have a personal experience, you know, in Germany at the Minster between the Catholic theology and yeah. evangelical. And it was a dialogue there among faculty, students, you know, because of course for the Catholic part, most of the students, you know, were of Catholic background. But there I've seen this dialogue in action and I'm very impressed, you know. Yeah. Not necessarily Lutherans, but you know, uh, Protestants in general. And uh, and in my view, education is key. Just uh, uh, exposing students, you know, to, to this richness of the Christian tradition, to the roots of Christian tradition, how much we have in common. That's uh, a contribution that we as uh, you know, academics can make. To yeah. And destroying the caricatures. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Which I hope I did a little bit. Yes, you did. And I really want to see, you know, that statement. That you, because we can build on that statement. <laughs> can you share that? <laughs> we insist. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to ask: Will it be a bad wish to say, "Oh, I wish that the reformation didn't come"? <laughs> That's a very good question, but I don't have the option. It happened. And that's why I tried to make clear in my comments, you know, these efforts are not an attempt to rewrite history, but to acknowledge that history and move on from it. Clearly, you know, there was not the apparatus, there were not the individuals in the 16th century, all of which could have avoided this. We see that much more clearly now, but they weren't there. Or at least not there in sufficient number to do it. I mean, when Cardinal Cajetan bent Luther in that famous interchange in 1518, uh, he, I mean, there were two things that were significant about that. He said to Luther, you are describing a new kind of church. You know, this is not what I've heard before, the stress on justification. But at the end of that conversation, Cardinal Cajetan did not declare Luther a, a heretic. But we can't go beyond that. I mean, we're all people in the 21st century. Yeah. I wanted to say thank you. It's an incredibly interesting talk. Um, and I, I remember seeing uh, on Good Friday, 2018, I think it was, the Holy Father, uh, the, the, you normally have the 
preacher to the papal household gives a talk in front of the Holy Father at the Vatican, and it was Father Cantal Messa, and he said in that talk, said Luther, we, we are all a great debt to Luther uh, for the bringing us, bringing the church back to a, to a full, fuller understanding of justification. And I, I was really quite uh, surprised, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. to see it in that context. Uh, and I, but it made me very happy because I just could see how much we had, we had moved ahead, you know, just through all the work that you just described. And so, um, and I, so I just want to, I guess I want to ask a question if you could speak a little bit more about it. You said that Luther was, uh, some people would look at it and say Luther was um, critiquing a view of Catholicism that was not truly Catholic. And it seems to me that, in a way, Father Cantavalesa was saying the same thing. So I was just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit more. The lens through which Luther, now this is a generalization, the lens through which Luther saw much of Catholicism was nominalism and Gabriel Beetle. Luther really wasn't familiar with Thomism or Aquinas and so on. So Luther in Germany and Erfurt and so on encountered a Catholicism that he thought was genuine and which he had great trouble with. But I think what Lortz brings out, although some people want to debate this with him, was that Luther was fighting an enemy that didn't exist. It wasn't Catholicism. Which heightens the tragedy, may I say? That was but then add to it the personality of Martin Luther. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that helps. It does. No, it does. I just, I, you make me want to read further. That's, that's dangerous, I guess. That's the highest compliment. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> right. Dr. Rush, uh, uh, Dr. Rush, thank you so much for uh, being here, your presentation. And Senior Donna, thank you also for bringing this together and for both of you have done in this area. Dialogue. Uh, many of the students here are not all of them, but many of them are a part of class. You know, we're looking at Catholicism and ecumenism. And um, I'll ask it. They may have other questions as well, but I'll ask a question oftentimes comes up in class as, as lay people. Um, and it really does turn to the concrete, and those concrete steps that you mentioned uh, towards towards visible unity. Um, I think particularly you mentioned the realism and just recognizing Imagine the Lutheran Church, the formation of women, sexual ethics. But I'm also mindful of the Lutheran Church itself in the United States, as maybe not over these issues, but different denominations of the Lutheran Church, between maybe Missouri Synod versus the Evangelical Lutheran Church, have also probably found different ways of, of expressing themselves as relations to those issues. What, is, what does it look like to have unity with the Catholic Church uh, or take steps towards that? And those barriers being there, but there's also a division within Lutheran denominations as well. You can't wait for Lutheran unity <laughs> <laughs> to proceed. I mean, that is very clear. And the vision of some in the 1940s and 50s for one Lutheran church in the United States, um, you know, it's just not uh, realistic. Uh, there, there's a different hermeneutic operative in terms of reading the Lutheran confessions. Uh, and to summarize it, as I do with students, are the Lutheran confessions a barrier that set us off as pure prime, you know, prime letter, or are the Lutheran confessions, in fact, bridges out to others? And I think if you read the preface to the Augsburg Confession, the way it was intended, it was clearly intended to be a bridge out. And I mean, I, for one, just will not accept the view that the break was irrevocable in 1530. It was coming, but it wasn't yet. But you have a view of certain Lutheran church bodies, and I don't want to pejorative here, I hope I'm just descriptive, that there was a break, that it was justified, uh, that the Bishop of Rome is still the Antichrist, uh, and if that's the case, that is a rather serious obstacle. <laughs> but, you know, as I say, you can't wait for Lutheran. You, there is a global Lutheran community, the Lutheran World Federation, that has grown in maturity to see itself as a communion of churches. 
and uh, the Roman Catholic Church is staying to relate to it. I think it would relate to Missouri if there was an openness to do that. And some issues, you know, you're closer to Missouri than you are to us. To us, I mean, Missouri will not ordain women. Uh, but it's part of the mix. But there's pluralism in both of our communities. You may have a glue, you know, in terms of the papacy that holds you together. But I think you have to say through history, alongside that glue, there's been an enormous amount of pluralism. Please. Yeah, um, first of all, thank you for your talk. That was very interesting, especially considering a lot of things that we've discussed in class so far this semester. But my question for you, and also something that we discussed in class, are what do you think are some barriers to unity? Barriers to fuller unity, was that the question? Well, I think the, the you know, the, the items I've mentioned, uh, we need to understand together what the church is. We've not done that because it's not been the neuralgic issue in a way, but I think we need to talk far more about how we understand the church. Uh, what models of unity, you know, are possible. Uh, I think we'd agree we don't have to have a corporate merger, but I mean, what kind of unity I can we live in? full communion with each other. Uh, there's some components of that that are still unresolved. But you have to work on them. I mean, at one point, you know, people have said, a Lutheran Roman Catholic agreement on justification. I mean, in the Lutheran confessions, that is the article on which the church stands or falls. Now, what does it mean that we agree about that doctrine? Today, that's got to have all kind of implications yet to be explored. That help? Yeah. <laughs> I remember kind of mentioned um, the aspect of ecumenism, and I kind of wanted to focus on that a little bit. Specifically, hearing you talk about uh, this topic today, communication between two major groups, I couldn't help but think about the current landscape that the United States is uh, dealing with, especially with the events that went on yesterday um, with our government. I wanted to know from someone who has so much experience with and knowledge with two groups coming into unity and communicating with each other. What is, what is it exactly that the United States specifically is doing wrong for two political parties? Small question. I don't think that's part of my mandate. But let me just say, I think you know there are some there's some parallels with ecumenism and stuff. What are the limits of diversity? How far can you push those? You know, uh, is there a common vision that we, as the American Republic, share today? I think we've got to you know discussions about those things. And I would only go so far as to say, I think there's certain parallels with the debate about the unity of the church, but I wouldn't push them too far. Oh, is, is there a similar process uh, with the Lutherans? You mentioned taking those groups to visit the ecumenical patriarch with the Eastern Orthodox. Is there a, a sort of a regular meeting? We have an international and national dialogue uh, with the Orthodox churches. Yes, uh, I don't think the staff relationships are quite as formalized as they are with the Vatican, but there are regular, regular contacts. And the dialogue has produced some significant material. I think what you're referring to, like I mentioned, I think earlier about the trips that yes, they yeah. have. So that was a that was a very creative way of bringing people who never saw each other before with Lutherans into contact with Catholics, with the Pope. It was over the papacy. The papacy was one of the problems in the 16th century. But to bring them face to face and let them talk, and then the other traditions, the Orthodox, I thought that very creative way of starting some ecumenical contacts. 
but my, my, getting, getting back to the idea of the personal. Yeah. Nobody ever came back from those trips the same. Nor did I, shepherding 12 bishops around. <laughs> <laughs> Be sad of Seth. Can I? I'd like to ask a question. You're teaching at Yale. You're teaching uh, Lutherans, Lutheran students, Lutheran ministry students. Also, I mean, how how do they? How do the Lutheran students react today to? Luther and Lutheran teachers, they have um, challenging questions about it. Well, I'm just wondering what experience you have at Yale with teaching Lutheran studies. Well, it's in what the kind of thing I shared this afternoon. It's insightful for many of them. Uh, they have not thought of Luther in this way, and alas, some of their parish experiences have not lifted up this kind of picture of Luther. Some do, like Reconciliation, Reformation, Sunday. Um, ecumenism isn't at the top of their list, but uh, when they hear about important things, they're willing to be engaged. Uh, I have over the years, when I've done the seminar on the Lutheran confessions, I, or, or Luther, uh, I have had Roman Catholic students uh, in the course. One year it was fascinating. I had a Muslim uh, who was here from Istanbul and said, Do we know what this course is about? And so on. He said, Look, Luther said all those nasty things about the Turks. That's why I'm here. I want to learn more. He said, Well, you know, it wasn't the Turks of today. <laughs> But he made a real contribution to the course and wrote an interesting paper. So that's part of the excitement of being in a place like that. It's up to you. If I may ask, are you, are you, you are a Lutheran pastor as well as a professor at Yale. Do you, do you still, you, do you, you don't have a parish though, right? Or do you, like, that would be too much probably to anybody. It would be, <laughs> yeah. I get called on, and the understanding is it's got to be a real emergency. Uh, there's just so much you can do. Yeah. Took a haven, and I have done that, I know. Right, yeah. <laughs> But being a Lutheran pastor is an important part of my identity. Yeah. I'm sure there's a pastoral aspect to your work with the students. Yeah. I mean, last last year I had a very bright student who decided that he was going to do a PhD with us. In, uh, came to me toward the end of the term and said, uh, I've decided to become a candidate for ordination. I, I take that as something that's come out of that experience. Yeah. That one way in the back. Yes, please. I was ask, I know the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America and the Episcopal Church are in full communion with each other. That's I was, right. I was going to ask what that looks like in practice for them being in full communion. Well, it depends, you know, where you are. Uh, it's lived out in various ways locally, but it is a commitment to full communion, a recognition of baptism, the exchangeability of clergy, which was a controversial issue in putting that uh, in place. Its goal is not organic union. Both churches exist, you could say, as sister churches, uh, and they live in this, this relationship of mutual commitment to ministry, to mission, to the availability of clergy from one church to the other uh, and so on. Uh, I think by and large, it's worked quite well. Thank you. But others may want to speak to that. If I'm not mistaken, you were involved. Yeah. <laughs> so. Remember, Jack, documents are anonymous. 
Yes. Uh, what, uh, what what kind of difference do you see in, in just on the ground dialogue uh, as it kind of plays out in, for instance, an American context versus a German context? Are are there are there big differences that you notice? Know? I know a lot of the dialogue takes place in kind of the World Federation level, but just any differences in those two settings? Oh, there there are differences yeah. for sure. Yeah, and I mean we are blessed by the fact that. Catholics and Lutherans in the United States are in sufficient number that we can, you know, sustain a, a, a dialogue. We're also blessed, I think, in some ways, that the burden of history is not on us in quite the same way. For many Lutherans, and I think a few mutual friends that we might share, uh, Lutheran identity is formed by not being Catholic. I remember being in Augsburg when the joint declaration was signed, walking across the square, going to church, and a German pastor, you'd know who I was, came up to me carrying a big sign, I'm failure, a mistake. Mm. Uh, as you might know, theological faculties in Germany were very difficult in terms of the signing of the joint declaration. We succeeded, but there was intense debate. And may I say this, much of it based on a misunderstanding. Differentiating consensus in the joint declaration does not mean we have solved all the issues on justification. It means there are no longer any church dividing issues. And that distinction is critical. Yeah. But some of those discussions live out in the Lutheran World Federation. For more than once, Monsignor Radana was at meetings. <laughs> Anything else? Thank you very much. So we just asked, uh, you know, that people want to hang out and have some more coffee or some more cookies or any food, please feel free. Uh, I know some people have class at two, including myself, but you know, you're welcome to join the chat. Thank you, Dr. Stockdale. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Monsignor Madonna uh, for bringing uh, Dr. Rush here. Okay. Um, is it for a doctor or is it for a reverend? We'll just go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for the pleasure. This was great. It's you know, with all the division in the world, like and that one question sort of alluded to it. It's so wonderful to hear about these the, this joining together. It's, it's such a crucial. It is. It's heartening. It is. Laura is one of our professors in the core. She's going to be teaching for us in the spring. Also yeah. very close. Yes. Very close friend. Yes. <laughs> Very good friend. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, what was the name? It was Dr. Lipkin, I think you said at Yale. Volker Lipkin. Volker. Uh, Volker is his first name. Okay. He was dean at uh, on the faculty of Tübingen in Germany. Okay. I'm amazed that we got him. I don't know quite how that has happened. About the uh, right? foreseeable future, and he's coming around the park. Right. Okay, great. Hey. Yeah, very good, right? Very much wishes this year. St. Luther's a Dr. medieval Catholic theologian. And only time can reveal that to us, I guess. Well, it, 16th century didn't have to be the way it was. Right. Well, yeah. they'll say this about the century, too, I suspect. <laughs> As a disruption of the internet, I mean, it's there's similar technological upheavals that have caused. Right. Who yeah. is involved with the group at Yale? What is it? Yale Center for Faith and Culture. Oh, yeah, with Wolf? Yes. Yes. Yes, I think I get to attend classes free online if I have time at Yale Divinity. I'm going to double check on that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big deal.
Awesome. And, uh, it is, yeah, and a lot of lot happening. Mm -hmm. in a, and and all these things foster the same sort of dialogue by asking these fundamental uh, questions, yeah. right? Yeah. Very very just interesting. Like here. Here. Yes, yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to, you know, I just read a book, uh, and I wish I had brought it with me about uh, the Haku thing in Germany after in in the sixties. And it created a big problem uh, about yeah, the Holocaust. I think what the argument was the Pope responsible. Yeah, the 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 it was, was a disagreement uh, among the churches as a result of that. Yeah, and the reaction of the churches. Uh, did, does any of that transfer to here to this country? Because I don't think we. I don't think we were in that argument. Yeah. I'm not sure it does. Yeah, okay. I don't know. It's a big problem with the, the Catholic Church in the Vatican too. I mean, what you were, what, yeah, what you were saying, that we have glue, but sometimes the glue is frayed. So, you know, and, uh, well, yeah, and, and that's a concern to some of your friends. But my concern, the way they treated Alexei. It was a national thing rather than <laughs> some people were saying that uh, at that point in print that was, the German nation had a habit of of uh, heresy. <laughs> well, yeah, I have trouble with that. <laughs> oh, sure, I do too. I think that's what that is. Well, see, I taught speech for 50 years. And it seems to me a lot of this has to do with how we talk to each other. Or how or we're not talking to each other. Oh, sure, and the level of trust we're willing to convey in that conversation. Yeah, and this and this atmosphere is systematically conducive to that. And it, it's structurally, well, it used to be that way in the American Senate. So, but I'm afraid the gentility is on the side. But 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 what's the? Yeah, I could say something. <laughs> Uh, Pennsylvania race was incredible to me. I can't understand. I'm, well, I'm, I find it that, that that's a, a disgrace. I mean, the fact that that man, when they discovered his sickness, didn't relieve him of the responsibility. He won. It's a sheer term. And he can't articulate it. No, and he, they knew that when they put him up. They just wanted him to raise his hand. Uh, so, Speech in this country, I, I wonder if Newman's idea of gentility would work in this country. So he expected people to get together to be gentlemen. And, uh, I think that's saying. Uh, okay. I'm sorry. I agree with you. I agree with you. I, I don't know if I could, I've been retired for 10 years. I don't know if I could teach speech today in the class because I don't think they come at 18 ready for. No, they come with other things. Oh. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. It was, you were quite wonderful. I enjoyed it very much. And congratulations to you, sir. I, I keep walking around telling people that we have a, I told him he should write some reminiscences of the things he's seen, even if it's only for us. It should not be lost. Yeah. And that he, that you two are old friends. Is, we won't be here forever. No, I, if we have an archive. Somebody may want to talk about it later on. Yeah. Well, anyway, congratulations. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Thank you very much. Well, thank you oh, nice. Time. Yeah, nice yeah. to meet you again. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Um, yeah. Thank you, Monsignor, for bringing him. <laughs> that was very enlightening. Yeah, I've always been interested in ecumenism because of my own background. You know, in Nigeria, we have a lot of. Uh, Anglicans, Pentecostals, then Muslim. So it's a very conflictual coexistence. You're from Nigeria. Yes. We know your cardinal. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we know the new one or the old one. I guess it's the old one. Uh, yeah, Arinze. Yeah, because he, he headed. Good friend. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because he headed the uh, dicastery for interreligious dialogue yeah. before he moved over to doctrine.
Oui. Alors, non, liturgie. D'accord. Liturgie. Liturgie. It's not, it, but it's, it wouldn't be a bar theological barrier necessarily. I teach a course and develop a course on Catholicism. This was a great success. So it just seems that a true kingdom's interpretation may not be that encouraging signs of the work. But I may be distorting, or maybe that maybe that's not a solution to that standard. But from all the four of us to the third, and we rely on grace. And, well, the doctrine of the two kingdoms, I mean, they're always distinguished, but they enter 91 and penetrate each other. Yeah, and that's what I'm trying to we work simultaneously in both. Going back to the city of God and the well, city of the God. I think Laura wants a copy of that. So I've gotten, I'm trying so to work that out. Yeah. Really? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. They ask good well, questions. Thank you, my senior. That's okay. great. Thank you. 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 There's a lot of you in the background. Oh. <laughs> we should you, read it. Must, we should, you should have let that this uh, our students have been reading this text, so you should you should you should have let that. They should you know, let them know he's there. They should come. He oh. led, he should come to meet the Pope. Wow, oh, wow. that's so this beautiful. Probably your idea too, right? Mm -hmm. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thanks to you both. I really do appreciate it. Well, thanks. thanks. He tied. You're not Catholic. No, 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 no. When you were saying, you know, about uh, like we, we need to do that, but yeah. uh, Todd and you are a uh, good peaceful, right? Sure. right? And he, he, uh, very, very, very active, you know. Uh, and so, yeah. I mean, it's, I just think it's so beautiful to me, like, like when you just see what's happening, like you said, just the fact that you're here, like that wouldn't have happened, you know, like even 60 years ago. Vatican II and the Popes and I, I don't know, like it's very beautiful. And you guys, Eve of Luther's birthday. And that's your, I, didn't I didn't know, know that. that either. I didn't that's know that either. Really like, that's why I don't know. Okay. I had, I had not known all that. We're going to choose a date for the dinner. Yes, okay. yes. Yeah, we're not going to, you know, let you get off without having a dinner with us. So. Well, I look forward to that. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, I, you know, I'm pretty flexible. And just if, if you know, uh, like Todd, uh, of course, I know you're, you're usually like to go up by three, but maybe yeah. one. one oh, gosh, yeah. No, 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 I'll stay for dinner. <laughs> I'd always stay for dinner. <laughs> yeah, he turns into a prophet at three. Bit that traffic, that New York traffic. But um, so, so, yeah, maybe Monsignor, you could work it out with Bill, and then we could, you know, just. Okay, sure. Hi. Not going anywhere. Generally speaking, Wednesday or two, Tuesday is not Tuesday is impossible. New, New, New Haven, right? right. Occasionally on Thursday, but not every Thursday. So Wednesday is good. If we plan in advance, Thursday can be good. 
Either of those are fine. Five minutes. Yeah, as long as the dates over. Yeah. You want to do it before Thanksgiving? I mean, I, I could, I could do it. Let me look. I have everything next week. I have like this. Another prayer group, actually, that Laura and I are both looking on. He's on Tuesday, but not every Tuesday. But this would not be a Tuesday. We just met. For dinner, the 16th is fine. 16th is next. Oh, hold it, hold it. I'm sorry, it's not. Oh. 17th is fine. That's a Thursday. I, I could see I'm doing that agape latte. Heard that? Oh, yeah, that's yeah. that on Thursday. Um, so that's Thursday. So that's, that's the that, seventeenth. Okay. Bill. Yeah, that's, so. that's important. Okay. That's I've already great. agreed to do that. That's have you done those things? I haven't done one. No, I know Greg Floyd did it, and yeah. um, Melinda Picaccio. Yeah, they're talking about Melinda. Yeah, her dress was amazing. Uh, somebody was just telling me about about yours, but I, I you're going to do it, I, Jackie, I think. Yeah, Jack. Yeah, yeah. She she organizes her. She's she's terrific. She asked oh, a really good question. She told me she loved your class. She oh, said, yeah. She said it. She goes, this class may be one of my favorite class that I've ever taken. It's showing up and yeah, yeah. I'm showing up and. Have a conversation about what uh, what was supposed to be a conversation. Well, I just always like to pass those things along. <laughs> but I I'm going to have to run off to my class, which okay. is at two. So it, I'll you know if you could work out a Friday date. the 18th works for me. After that, I don't have to go after Thanksgiving. I, I think I could do the 18th. Friday. I think so. I don't know if that works for time. Let me look here. Uh, but I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to cross though because I'm the last one. I mean, it looks available, but I would have to double check. To yeah, make yeah. sure. Okay. And I'm, ha I'm happy that that's the as well, whatever. Yeah, me too. Whatever. That would be fine too. Whatever. Yeah, thank you both so much. I so appreciate this. I appreciate the presentation, Bill. Yeah, it was You're wonderful. Welcome. Looking forward to, uh, to dinner together. Yeah, I look forward to that. And we do, we do want to be paying you. I know, I know, like you don't care about that. I know that, but, but we, we, yeah, thank you. I would come for me. I know that. We know that. But thank you. But, but especially you know, these days. We just, you know, like that's just, we're going to pay some winter bell. Uh, she's, she's, Going to work. She's. I think she's putting that in motion. She. Oh, she does yeah. all that kind of stuff. So. I, thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Nancy. Have a good class. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you, Monsignor. Okay. Oh, yes. Natural. So, I think I like Thank you very much. Oh, good. That means a lot of times.
request to her on before we leave. It's nice to get a direct one. There. Yeah, yeah or we can just go after him too. It's probably what I jotted down through. I didn't know how long I would need. Green? 30, but that, there must be something earlier, Jeff. Me. Students were listening. They were listening. Oh, yeah. They were kind of Yes, yes, yes. That's in question. Yeah, I'm ready to go. Thank you very much. 